construction on leave campaigning for the seat of state superintendent of public education and running against Dr. Max Rafferty. Without any further introduction, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Wilson Riles. Thank you very much. I want <coughs> to first thank you for the opportunity of uh, meeting and meeting you and sharing a few of my ideas, giving you an opportunity to raise a few questions, and I'll try to respond to them. Uh, so I'll be reasonably brief. Um, I think the first question that uh, one should ask uh, any candidate for public office, uh, why is he running? And uh, I'll try to answer that first. Um, I've been in the Department of Education since 1958, going up first as a consultant, taking a civil service job, working on certificated employment practices to try to uh, create situations in the state of California where teachers would be employed on the basis of their qualifications without regard to race, uh, religion, or national origin. I worked at that post until, oh, 60, when I was uh, took an examination for chief of the Bureau of Intergroup Relations. Uh, in that post, uh, I did my bit to uh, create conditions on campuses uh, at the high school level and elementary school level um, to develop good personal human relations understanding and so on. Uh, in 1965, the legislature passed uh, what is called the McAteer Act, which is a unique uh, piece of legislation uh, designed to raise the achievement level of children from low-income families. Because we've found uh, that uh, poor children tend to do less well in school and uh, the state was determined to do something about this problem. Uh, by 1965, the legislature had uh, come to a conclusion that uh, many people in the public uh, in the state had not uh, realized that Max Rafferty uh, was a person that was not interested in education. So they set up the division in the department and made the director responsible directly to the board instead of to the superintendent. That's an unusual arrangement, but uh, it was an unusual circumstance. I uh, became, uh, uh, was appointed by the board uh, director of compensatory education. Uh, it turned out to be with the use of elementary and secondary education. Uh, Education Act funds from the federal government uh, to be a hundred, uh, uh, more than a hundred million dollar program uh, uh, with state and federal money, uh, and we approved projects in districts uh, uh, for the perp for this purpose. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, the program uh, became a model one uh, for the country. Uh, the U.S. Office of Education uh, uh, time after time has uh, given commendations for the program, uh, its effectiveness uh, with children, its management of the resources, its innovations. Uh, for example, the, uh, we were able to develop the full concept of teacher aids, uh, both uh, paid and volunteer. We were able to develop a concept of community involvement uh, by requiring that each project have uh, uh, advisory committees on the project composed of parents uh, uh, and community leaders. Um, by the way, it's on the state that uh, has that uh, uh, parent involvement uh, uh, criteria for project approval. We were able to significantly raise the, and we concentrated on reading and math, and we were able to raise achievement level of, of children that uh, were considered the most difficult to, to, to teach uh, significantly. Uh, sometimes when you 
meet uh, with some success, it causes other ripples. And uh, the board last year was determined to try to get some life into the department, other areas, and uh, they reorganized the Department of Education. And um, that's what you do in a bureaucracy when you can't do anything about the top man. You try to reorganize around him. They created two new deputy ships, one for internal administration and administrative services, the other uh, for program and legislation. The deputy for program and legislation was to have total responsibility for all programs in the Department of Education, including compensatory education, general education, and special education, and also to act as liaison to the legislation, legislature. And I was asked by the board to uh, take this job. And by the way, Max Rafferty uh, agreed uh, for me to take this position. Um, but as I found out later, he was only concerned with a liaison with the legislature, and he wasn't uh, willing to settle down and allow the changes to be n made uh, uh, in the department uh, so far as instruction goes. Um, I presume uh, my success with the legislature, able to get programs through in compensatory education, contrasted so strongly with his appointee, his chief deputy, Albert Calvert, uh, who on two occasions uh, was so uh, persona non grata with the legislature that uh, they deleted his salary from the budget. <laughs> now, in case you think it was partisan, I, I would have to point out that the first time around it was a Democratic-controlled legislature. But last year, when they deleted his salary, it was a Republican-controlled legislature. So has nothing to do with partisan politics. He, he's just an incredible person. He did not give them any information and data. Uh, he did not level with them, and so they just got to the point where they said uh, to Max Rafferty, don't send him over here anymore. Um, I remember uh, back when I was uh, uh, on the, in the uh, director of compensatory education, it's usually uh, u usual procedure for your legislative representative to sit with you before the finance committee when you are developing your budget. And I have found myself in the peculiar position of sitting there with my budget uh, being considered by a committee and the chief deputy sitting by me and hoping that he would oppose my budget because then I knew, know the committee would approve it. Uh, sounds incredible, but absolutely true. That, that kind of situation we found ourselves in. I took the deputyship uh, in October because I, I, I hoped against hope that uh, since Max Rafferty had uh, been defeated uh, for the Senate, uh, it was obvious to me and everyone that he was using the Department of Education as a stepping stone, but he had been defeated. I was hoping that he would be ready to settle down and, uh, and um, do something for education. But I, 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 I was wrong. Um, Ray Johnson, who was appointed to the other deputy ship, uh, uh, we would get together in uh, those early days in October and, and uh, sort of cry on each other's shoulder. He, I remember he would uh, say, well, I, we can't do this, I'm going to quit. And I would say, Ray, you can't do that. Too, too many people are depending upon uh, us to really get something moving. And uh, I would persuade him to keep trying. And then three days later, I would call him and say, Ray, I'm going to quit <laughs> because I can't get any place. And he would persuade me to stay on and keep trying. And finally, uh, uh, around the 1st of November, I got a call from him on a Saturday night, and he said that he had been to his physician and he could not carry on uh, under that kind of strain, and he had already sent in his resignation. And it came through to me that uh, 
the game was over. Uh, I could have stayed around and drawn a salary and and uh, passed papers uh, from one side of the desk to another, I presume, until I retired. But I can't do that, and uh, I decided to quit, pick another job. And then I thought that that's exactly what five other educators have done since Max Rafferty came in 1963. Uh, first starting with Richard Klaus, who's now superintendent, uh, county superintendent in Los Angeles County. He left uh, out of frustration soon after Max came. Uh, Graham Sullivan, who's deputy superintendent in the LA Unified School District, took his place and then quit, went to work for Commission on Education and is now here in Los Angeles out of frustration. Ronald Cox, one of the top fiscal men uh, in education, uh, knows education finance uh, better than anyone I know, quit out of frustration, is now working for the California Senate. Frank Doyle retired early, top special education man. Uh, Ray Johnson and then Wilson Riles. Uh, but quitting and taking another job would have um, satisfied my personal <laughs> need, but I, I just thought about the matter and it wouldn't satisfy uh, uh, the getting the kind of leadership that we must have in the state if we're going to improve education. So I uh, called uh, some friends, uh, former board members and so on that had been urging me to run over even over a year to think about running for superintendent of public instruction and I had turned them down saying that I was not a politician, had no interest in running for anything but to go out and find someone to run against Max and I would stay on and give whatever help I could give. Well, I called to find out whether they had, they had found anyone and they told me they had not. Uh, for various reasons, uh, the people they thought were qualified uh, to do the job uh, didn't want to get in this business of running for office. So I told them that I was leaving and uh, to make an assessment of my chances. Uh, I didn't want to go through any exercises in futility, but if there was a chance to win, to let me know and I would consider running. And I told them that I, I, I wasn't... Uh, looking for a 50-50 chance, uh, necessarily. I've, I've seldom had 50-50 chances in what I've done. I, I, I just wanted to know whether that was a fighting chance. And they reported back uh, about a week later that it would be if uh, I could get the kind of support uh, uh, to get out and, and have people get acquainted and have people know the kinds of programs that I'd operated and the kind of uh, projections that I could make uh, for the future. And, uh, and it was on that basis that I, I decided to run. Um, I am convinced, uh, and I say this with all the uh, sincerity that I can command, uh, that Max Rafferty uh, is a disaster so far as education is concerned in this state and the children and the schools cannot stand four more years of Max Rafferty. I felt for a long time that this should not be a political, or, or that is an elective office, that it should be appointed by the board, uh, given the board longer terms so that no one governor could appoint all the members let the board appoint the superintendent and make him accountable because the needs of the off, you need a person who can administer schools, care about schools, give full time to it, um, know something about curriculum, uh, uh, employ personnel and able to pull people together and to get a person of that caliber and then have him be a politician on the side is, is a is a lot to ask. Uh, you can get one or the other. You have a master politician now, but it's a disaster for the schools. Now, um, I, since I've been traveling over the state trying to 
uh, communicate with people uh, and uh, the physical drag and drain uh, for the last four months has reinforced uh, my feeling that the job ought to be appointed and uh, I'm going to work for that when I'm elected. However, there are some uh, interesting things that happen and some rewarding things. Uh, uh, the rewards uh, come because I find people that I talk to um, are interested. Uh, and I sometimes I felt that people didn't care. Uh, but I'm finding that most people I meet do care. Uh, they are not satisfied with the simplistic answer to complex questions. Uh, and that, that is rewarding to me because I, I feel if we can get the message over to people in a rational way uh, and point to some directions for the solution of problems, they will respond. And I needed to know that. Uh, there are some amusing things that happen occasionally. I had a couple to happen to me on planes. Uh, uh, I used to read a lot when I travel, but now I try to talk a lot on planes and uh, and I will have a piece of literature in my pocket and the first opportunity get on the question of the campaign. And I was flying from Santa Barbara about a month ago and sitting next to me was a man, I found out he was from Huntington Beach and uh, uh, he finally said, well, you're running for superintendent, you're running against Max Rafferty. And I said, yes. He says, well, this is quite a coincidence. He said his family knew the Rafferty family back in Sioux City, Iowa. He says, in fact, his father worked in the Rafferty home and took care of Max as a baby. And he says his father didn't like him then. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally, uh, something happens uh, and you... <coughs> don't know how to take it. I didn't know how to take uh, this one. I was on my way to Los Angeles again, this time from Sacramento, and I saw a former employee, uh, uh, at least an employee, a bureau chief in the department that I've known for a number of years, and I said, how, 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 uh, how are things in the department since uh, I've been on leave and away campaigning? And he went on to tell me how things are getting progressively worse uh, he can't get his programs through, he cannot get any leadership, and uh, uh, he felt things were going to disintegrate further, and he just didn't know what to do. And he thought a moment, and he says, uh, Wilson says, you know, we just have to have a change. And uh, he says, you know, you are our great white hope. <laughs> I had to think about that a little <laughs> bit, uh, uh, but I, I, I got his point. Uh. Now, let me mention a few of the directions that I think uh, we can go and should go, and if I'm elected, uh, uh, we'll bend every effort to see that we move in that direction. I'm not going to mention any pie-in-the-sky ideals uh, and ideas. I could do that. Um, but over the years, I've uh, come to temper my uh, idealism with um, practicality. And I have to apologize to you young people uh, and say that I don't want you to lose your ideals. But uh, uh, with the time I have left, I don't have a lot of energy to expend, and, and I want results from it. And uh, getting results means that I put together every bit of uh, experience and knowledge that I have and, uh, and, and, and become an advocate for children, because that's what a superintendent and an education leader ought to be. Um, number one, uh, I feel that we have to set a tone, and this is not so much a program, but a tone uh, whereby people who are concerned with schools, parents, and administrators, and boards, uh, can lay out problems, analyze them rationally, and then get to work on solving them for the children. 
uh, and not engage in the kind of thing that Max Rafferty perpetuates, is to divide people, polarize them uh, on such issues as sex education and uh, moral guidelines and all of that uh, kind of thing. It's not necessary to do that. People want to know what the problems are. They want a chance to analyze them, and they want help and direction to try to solve them. Now, I mention this as a tone because if we don't do that in public education, then I think we will hardly be able to solve the, the, the gigantic problems that, that face us. Now, among those um, directions, uh, problems that have to be high on the agenda is to find the resources with which to give support to the school. And I have to say here that uh, uh, this method that we have of financing the schools by district local property tax is out of date, archaic, and will not work anymore. Uh, we have to move to a different tax base, and I think that tax base has to be the state tax base. Uh, it will not even, I don't think, require a change in the Constitution, because the Constitution speaks of of having education um, with the first call on state funds. Um, we have vast inequities uh, among districts uh, on the present basis. Uh, I know of districts with uh, industry, uh, vast industrial complex with, uh, complexes within its borders and relatively few children, and they have more money than they need to operate schools. Most districts do not have this. And they have uh, uh, children, local property tax payers may be paying eight times as much, and they don't have enough to operate quality education programs. I think we begin by changing the priority, uh, even before we start talking about new taxes. And I believe that education should be at the top which of course means moving something else down and I don't want to get into that argument unless you push me. I think there are many things that could be moved down. But in any case, I know education should be moved up. Um, I think this would clear some of the inequities if the state put in the major resources to guarantee every, every child an adequate education. I sincerely believe that the quality of the education should not depend upon which district uh, the parents of the children happen to live. That every child in the state ought to have guaranteed to him an adequate educational program. And it's the state's responsibility to see that it's done. Now, added to this must be something else that I'm concerned about. In that is the use, effective use of these resources. Because I'll have to tell you in all honesty, if you just simply put in more money, I see no guarantee that you would have an output commensurate with the input, which means we are going to have to make some vast changes in our educational system, and I think they must go along with uh, getting new money. I feel that we are going to have to decide what uh, we want to do with the public schools, what the public schools ought to be doing, and there's no consensus on this. Everyone has gone to school and they have an idea of how schools should operate, and, uh, but there's no consensus as to what the goals and objectives are, and I think we have to start with the setting goals and objectives. And I think they have to be refined down to performance terms in, uh, in the final instance, where we talk in terms of what we expect the performance of a student to be uh, over a period of time, and uh, we are working at those goals. And I think the people who set those goals uh, should be at the local school site level, and I think they ought to be established with parents and with students and teachers and the principal so that everyone knows the direction and what the purpose is as a start. And secondly, I think we ought to ask the people who are doing the job, what do they need? 
in order to meet the goals. Uh, this is much different from the process we have now of someone sitting up here giving you something uh, and expecting you to do the job. I think when the goals are set, then you ask the person who has to do the job, what do you need? Do you need different materials, more materials, flexible scheduling, smaller class size, uh, some type of in-service training? What do you need? And we provide that, and that's the way the budgets are built. And then um, we have to have an evaluation uh, to determine how well uh, we're doing, how were the objectives met, uh, were they exceeded. If they're consistently met, we have a good situation. If they are unmet, we use the uh, evaluation to feedback in and isolate the cause of why they were not met. And whatever that cause is, we, 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 we modify and change, including, by the way, sometimes we will isolate uh, uh, the, the cause as being a, an incompetent teacher. And when we find them, we should uh, work to um, find other employment uh, for them uh, rather than in the classroom. I say that because uh, I can't recall the last time that a teacher was fired for pure incompetence. Um, I remember last year a teacher was dismissed in Marin County for being overweight. Um, but that has nothing to do with teacher confidence. And we need to follow this method to objectively uh, determine competence. Uh, I, I, that, that means a modification of tenure laws. Um, I've been in this business 30 years, and I know we're pretty good in education, but not that good. There are a few around. There are a few teachers who hate children that have wound up in classrooms and uh, they're there to kind of take it out, out on the little ones, you know. Not many, but there are some, and we can't afford to have them. Now, one or two other areas in which, uh, which I will mention and then I'll stop talking. I guess uh, I would, uh, I would like to uh, develop a master plan for early education because I think that's where it's important, that's where the job, that's where it has to be done first. Um, we have always had a weak um, early childhood education program. Not, not enough emphasis has been placed there. Uh, we have tended to lean away from putting quality uh, there. And I think uh, if we can reinforce the early um, schooling, uh, we can get away from some of the rem remediation that is often ineffective and, uh, and expensive. Psychologists are telling us now that 50% of a learning potential is developed before the person is six years old. 80% by the time the individual is 17, which becomes very threatening to me because I'm 52 and uh, don't have much potential left. But the, the, the idea is that that's where the job must be done. And uh, that's the direction in every way that I'll pursue it. I have a few ideas I'd like to throw into the hopper on changes that I'd like to see occur. And I hope I don't lose any of you ladies who may be members of the Women's Liberation Movement uh, when I say this. But I have to say frankly that I think the primary uh, um, grades are too feminine-oriented. Uh, the rewards are given to the child who can sit neatly in the seat and color little squares and circles and triangles and make fine manuscript and be quiet and neat. And I submit that this discriminates against little boys. <laughs> and by the way, some little girls um, children at that age uh, need to move and need to hold and feel things and build and explore. 
And we're not going to get a relevant curriculum there unless we take that into account. The other area I, I, I went in, in this that I would like to see uh, something happen. I, I'd like to see more men teaching kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. <laughs> uh, I don't mean throw all of the ladies out, but uh, bring in some balance on this thing because young people respond to both the male and female. Ne they need this kind of, of, of interaction. Those are just two areas in which I would uh, like to see us move. Uh, the other area um, that I would mention, uh, I presume, would uh, deal with what is called student unrest, or whatever you want to call it. As you know, I would, uh, s if elected superintendent, will sit on the Board of Regents with a vote. I certainly could not hope to um, do everything, perhaps uh, carry everything my way, but I would use uh, whatever influence I had to, to help uh, solve the problems that uh, students and administrators face. I would not use the office for political gain and sound off. Uh, I would not say, as Max Rafferty has said, that the uh, University of California is a place to go to get uh, a four-year course in sex, uh, drugs, and treason. I think that's a disservice for the superintendent of public instruction to even utter. Um, I would uh, do my best if, if I couldn't help. I certainly would not do anything to inflame and I have some ideas about this, too, and I want to share them with you and perhaps get your reaction. I feel that uh, students, uh, this generation, which was different from my generation, uh, I read at my former college uh, actually three weeks ago, and they, I <laughs> I haven't changed my state. Four people were arrested for conducting a panty raid uh, my generation was uh, goldfish, fish eaters, and uh, people who crammed in telephone booths. Um, after that, uh, we had what we call the silent generation after World War II. And I can remember observing the European students and knowing their political awareness and wondering what will happen to America. Uh, and then all of a sudden we come upon this age and uh, <laughs> it's a different type of student, different type of concerns. I think we have to take this into account. As I've uh, observed students, my own four, mm, the youngest of which graduated uh, last uh, June, uh, the idealistic and frank, uh, you know, embarrassingly frank, um, and want involvement, I believe. Uh, I would not uh, uh, wait around for you to bring me non-negotiable demands. I would uh, certainly accept every problem concern that you had, but I would say, come on in, let's look at it. Let's analyze it. Let's see what we can do about it. I would uh, not only do that, I wouldn't sweep any under the rug and, and put them in desk drawers. I would be coming out with problems, and by the God knows we have enough, and say, come. I want you to help. I believe that that's what most students want. I believe that they want to have something to say about the policies that are set that govern their lives. I think they're entitled to it. Um, I am uh, pleased with what I'm beginning to see developed by a few students uh, to participate 
and to learn what makes the system move and begin to make that system move for justice. That's what I would work for. I saw something happen with a high school group that almost made me want to cry Monday in Santa Cruz. Here were, here, here, the, the, the board would not put a, a bond issue on the, on the ballot. And the high school students felt that they needed some improvements at their school. They found out that you could go out and get petitions and put it on. And they went uh, to the county courthouse to get petitions and, uh, and they would take them around. Um, they were not treated as men and women. Uh, they were looked upon as little upstarts that ought to be um, studying their history and so on. At any rate, they got the wrong information and they went out and got 2,000 uh, uh, names on the petition, put it on the ballot. And then someone told them that they didn't draw up the petition properly. They found that the board uh, could postpone uh, the taking of the petitions, give them a chance to, to go back again. The board wouldn't. And to see those boys and girls, high school, standing, pleading with tears in their eyes was more than I could take. They were trying to work in the system and were slapped in the face. It's these kinds of directions that uh, I feel that we should open up and develop communication, and set the goals and look at the dreams and get together and see can't we build the kind of society that we need to build. Now permit me one plug and I'll stop. In this election, June 2nd, uh, can be crucial because it can be over in a nonpartisan race. All the names will be on all the ballots and it's possible for one person to win in June. And Max Rafferty is definitely in the lead. If he gets 50% plus one vote, we have him for another four years. Now, I am doing everything that I can physically do and <laughs> Uh, to try to end his tenure. I, I'm out on this plank, uh, and I don't, uh, you know, don't make no apology. I'm going to put everything I can into it. And I'm here, frankly, uh, to see if I can get some of you to walk a little way with me. Thank you. We have a few minutes in which Dr. Riles will entertain questions from the audience, and I think it would probably be easiest if you'd just call on your questioners yourself, okay? Yes. Uh, the question is that we need bucks. How are we going to get them? Well, here's the way you get money. We're talking about techniques now, and I'm talking from the legislature. One, you have to assemble the representatives in the state who are concerned about education and those who support education. The real, the practically only place to do this so far as the public schools are concerned is at in the superintendent's office because all of the data uh, about schools and their operation, tax rates, uh, teachers' salaries, uh, number of pupils, projections, um, buildings, and so on, flow into the Department of Education. So the superintendent's role is very key if, if he will exercise it. Uh, one, you, you have to get the 
teacher representatives involved, the administrative representatives involved, uh, boards, school boards representatives involved on their needs, the Taxpayers Association, and I mention this uh, because if you leave them out, uh, you're in trouble, and uh, Chambers of Commerce and any other groups uh, that represent communities uh, uh, or segments of communities. And you develop a package, and it has to be a consensus one. But with this kind of support and this kind of development, you take this to the legislature and you get somewhere because it becomes in their self-interest to do something about it. But if you go off in the directions we're going with 20 you know, different finance bills, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, it's too easy to uh, you know, knock everyone off in all of the confusion. Now, the sources of the money, uh, it's there. The state is big and rich. And uh, it's just a matter of priority. Um, I think we have to leave the property tax as a vehicle. Uh, but then there are other sources. Uh, I would be willing to uh, put a little of the gasoline tax money in schools rather than in the freeways, for example. I would, uh, I'm not, although I'm a religious man, I, I'm, I'm really uh, not, 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 I'm willing to take a little sin tax, a little tax on bourbon or scotch or cigarettes or what have you if it's going to the public schools. Uh, the income tax, uh, you name it, all depletion uh, allowances, uh, the money is there if uh, the will is not there. Yes. 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 On the first question, uh, you're really talking about uh, what we used to call the core curriculum, uh, which considers that uh, education does not occur in little boxes and little courses, but it's a continuum and it's uh, in a broad package. Um, this can be done and uh, uh, it has relevance uh, to good education. Uh, by the way, Max Rafferty ran against, uh, built up a straw man of progressive education back in 1962, and that's what he ran against, uh, what he called progressive education. Uh, I think here, uh, once you establish the goals and objectives that I mentioned, uh, then you have the freedom to move into any uh, uh, procedure and technique in order to accomplish the goals, and I think this this is one way of doing it, and I think it ought to be encouraged and experimented with, and uh, it makes more sense, frankly, to me than trying to separate uh, everything because um, they actually aren't separate. Uh, it does take um, greater skills uh, uh, and, a, and a new type of thinking. Uh, it takes flexible uh, teachers, people, creative people. And that's what I think we ought to have uh, in these programs. Team teaching, for example, uh, is a way of approaching this. I notice uh, some of the latest school buildings are, are not in, divided into rooms, but uh, vast open complexes that give this freedom. Um, I, uh, I would uh, promote this. The way I found to, 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 to get something established uh, is to use by demonstration. Uh, if you, where you find this is working, you, you highlight it, uh, you collect information about it, you publicize it, and you get other people to come and see, and, and uh, that's the way you create uh, change. Now on the question of tuition, if I had been on the Board of Regents uh, 
I would have, I have to tell you, I would have voted against tuition. Uh, I would not have gone to the bathroom as Max Rafferty did to avoid voting at all. <laughs> um, we have it now. Uh, so it isn't relative what might have been done, but there is something before us that I think we ought to turn our attention to. I understand, uh, I heard the governor two, three weeks ago say that his feet w was not in concrete on the use of the tuition money and that he was concerned uh, about seeing that uh, students who were qualified and could benefit from a university college education uh, would not be denied because of uh, uh, their parents not having the money. And this is the relevant question now, and I, I hope you will find ways to turn your attention to this. I, I, I guess I'm so concerned because uh, I went to, when I entered college in 1936, Arizona State, I didn't have a penny in my pocket. They had a program called the NYA, you know, National Youth Administration, where the federal government uh, granted money to colleges and universities and, and they paid you a fee for working on campus. And I earned $15 a month uh, out of NYA funds working on campus. That was enough to buy, pay my fees and buy my books. And if I hadn't had that opportunity, I wouldn't be standing here today. Uh, but I feel that uh, this chance uh, has given me the opportunity to pay this back a thousand times and more in taxes. I've felt I've been an asset to communities in which I've lived. I've been able to rear four children, send them to college. I've not been without a job except, you know, now, and that's by choice. I think the best investment that you can possibly make is in the youth of the state. And so let's not build up barriers that are going to eliminate people because they can't afford the cost. Yes. I would support it. Uh, yes. I uh, don't know, you know, I stand here in an academic atmosphere and I certainly don't want to run down scholarship and doctor's degrees. My whole orientation is toward uh, performance. And I think the standards for administrators uh, should, uh, we ought to have some minimal standards. But I think the major uh, orientation should be toward getting the job done, which includes having rapport uh, with students and teachers and so on, rather than just adding on degrees. Uh, I wouldn't certainly, I certainly wouldn't eliminate anyone because of a degree, but then I would not eliminate one who could do the job because he did not have a degree. Um, I think that s most systems uh, have a procedure for administration that I would like to see change. A person becomes a teacher and then uh, he desires more money and uh, he goes into administration because administration pays more. 
Uh, I think we ought to find a, a system of rewards so that good teachers can remain in the classroom and uh, be paid to commensurate with their input rather than whether they're administrators or not. This is kind of a hierarchy that I don't, don't particularly like. I think the administrators are servants of the people that do the job, <laughs> and they should exist only for the because they are um, able to make an input. Um, uh, you move administrators around for so-called experience, and in most districts, uh, you would become superintendent of schools provided you live long enough. I, I don't like that procedure. I think people ought to be put into the individual schools on their ability to be able to do a job. Yes, sir. Yes. It'll be chaos. It'll be chaos if it passes. Uh, maybe not chaos is too strong a word, but uh, widespread confusion. Because Proposition 8, uh, uh, number 1, uh, doesn't provide uh, a, a source for the money that is required, assuming it is uh, required in order to carry it out. Uh, the legislature would have to find the source. Secondly, uh, some districts may already be receiving 50% of support depending upon how you interpret it. Uh, if you add in textbooks and uh, other services, uh, uh, some districts are already receiving 50% and will not be any better off. Uh, I am hoping that uh, the threat of Proposition 8 will be enough to move the legislature in the next two weeks to come up with a good package. Um, I am going to vote for it uh, if they do not come up with anything better because it does move in the right direction. But I would hope, uh, I just feel that the le this is the legislature's job and uh, it should only be a last resort when you use the initiative process on a thing of this kind. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, one more question, yes. Um, I don't think the superintendent of public instruction should mandate any one method of, uh, of integrating schools. I think the superintendent of public instruction ought to have the resources and the and the um, technical assistance to help school districts work out this problem. Why I say no mandate is because we're dealing with 1,200 districts with 1,200 different population patterns, and you have to have alternatives uh, to, uh, to do the job. I, I would like to talk about something more basic since you raised this question. Uh, and that is, why integration? And I can tell you why I support integration, and it's because uh, wherever it is uh, possible and feasible and reasonable, as some situations you can't integrate. If you have a district that uh, is all white or all black uh, under the system we have, you can't integrate. If you have a situation like um, South Central Los Angeles, it's unwieldy to, if you talk about integration in the context of moving bodies around, you know, you can't do that. Uh, but there are many other alternatives that, uh, that, that, that are available, providing people want to do this. Uh, exchanges of student body presidents, uh, regional festivals, uh, all kinds of opportunities, if you want it. Now, I think integrated schools, uh, wherever they can be accomplished, or certainly uh, opportunities for interaction is good simply because the kind of world in which we live in the 21st century, uh, 
children that are in school today will manage that will be a heterogeneous world. And it's about time that people learn to know that there's someone with a different color, may think a little differently, may have a different religion or a different ethnic background. And we are really preparing our children for the kind of world that they will have to manage. That's why I'm for it. Now, if you extend this further, and uh, as Coleman and some of the other intellectuals intend to do, I can't go along with it. In other words, if you say a black child has to sit by a white child for that black child to learn, or a brown child, I, I don't go along with that. I think it's condescending, paternalistic, and totally untrue. Uh, it's good for all children, and that's the basis on which it has to be sold. As a matter of fact, uh, I've worked for brotherhood and integration all my life. But if I were white, I would be working harder than I'm working now. Because we tend to misread, uh, because we live in America where whites are in the majority, uh, we assume that, the, you know, without thinking that this is the way the world is. It isn't. Whites are in the minority. And from a self-defense, a practical, uh, you know, just looking at it from that point, I, you know, you, you, we, we ought to be trying to get together. As a matter of fact, blacks are in the minority too. Uh, uh, every fourth person in the world are Chinese. So we'd better, you know, begin to take this seriously, uh, I think. But let's not get ridiculous and go off on these tangents uh, 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 and assume that the only way you're going to have a good education system is to have uh, have some kind of perfect racial balance. Uh, uh, that you know, no one, as I found, few people that object to busing. If they did, we wouldn't have eight hundred thousand children bus each day as they are now at a cost of $90 million per year. We would not have 30,000 per day bust in Los Angeles Unified School District. But when you talk about integration, it's something else that's triggered. And I suspect what's triggered is that someone feels that that child will be bust into an inferior school or they'll be bust in the school where the achievement level is low and somehow this is going to affect their child or the behavior is different and so on. At least I think these are triggered. And we'd better bring out these uh, problems and deal with those uh, rather than allow this subtlety to be all wrapped up in what do you think about busing. Um, I feel that we can uh, amicably do whatever we can in this area, but I'm going to give my emphasis on good quality schools that are the most effective that we can make them. Uh, and then, and to the extent that we can integrate schools, I will support that. But I, for one, am not willing to relegate another generation of children. You know, the 1954 decision was passed 16 years ago. And we adults have been arguing and having court cases while a generation of children have gone without a minimum education. And I'm not willing to do that. I want to thank each of you for the opportunity of meeting you and, change and exchanging ideas and answering questions. Uh, again, I, I would hope that uh, if you feel strongly that we need to change the present incumbent and either retire him or end his tenure, I hope you'll do whatever you can about it June 2nd. Thank you. <laughs>